Hello world, you are listening to Strategicon, your window to all things security and foreign affairs. It is Thursday, February 12, 2015, episode 3. I'm your host, John Bruni, and with me in the studio today is co-host and Sage International Associate David Olney from the University of Adelaide. And missing from the studio today is Strategicon moderator Ashley Felderhoff, and he sends his apologies. Anyway, good evening to Alicia, our producer, who will be filling in for Ashley, and good evening to David. Good Hi. evening, John. Hello. Okay, so Alicia, in the news, what do we see today? Well, today in the news is the New York police officer charged in stairwell shooting of an unmanned man. We also have the Greek finance minister enters the Eurozone lion's den. The Costa Concordia captain sentenced to 16 years for the 2012 shipwreck. Uh, Time Warner profits beat as reven- revenue rises in Turner HBO profits. Oh, units, sorry. U.S. gunman kills three young Muslims and the motive is disputed. Thousands protest against healthy rule in Yemen after embassies close. And leaders hold the Ukraine peace talks as fighting surges. We also have Obama administration weighing off Afghan requests to slow withdrawal of U.S. troops. But the one thing that I think is quite pertinent to us is the um, the fact that the U.S., is considering selling its defensive weapons to the Ukraine during this uh, uh, troubling time. What do you guys think? I think that these are defensive weapons. I think that they're offensive weapons that look like they're defensive weapons, but will be used in an offensive fashion in a place called Ukraine. So really, when it comes down to spin doctoring your way out of a politically tricky situation, it's amazing. Oh, I suppose that's why they get paid the big mark, the big bucks. But it's amazing how politicians can 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 say something and actually not really mean what they say, but mean the exact opposite. Um, I think that uh, the idea of selling advanced weapons uh, to Ukrainian authorities in order to roll back pro-Russian uh, rebels in, in the east of Ukraine is not necessarily the smartest move because, you know, the Russians are going to necessarily up the ante. And the central question here is that, well, what happens if the Russians get the upper hand? What happens if a, a stockpile of um, U.S. equipment gets into Russian hands? Do you think that the Russians aren't going to take that back to their factories, pull it apart, put it back together again, and end up with better weapons? I don't know. Dave, what do you think? I think what is interesting is how excellent are these defensive weapons going to be? Is it going to be current spec kit? Is it going to be a speck of kit from the early days of war in Iraq and Afghanistan? Is it going to be reserve type stuff from the National Guard? If they send very high quality kit, it will give the Russians a reason to start using all their re-equipped Spetsnaz troops with brand new body armor and bad new weapons and brand new night vision because they'll need to do something to counter it. Mm. And we'll end up with a case where militias with not enough training and unknown motivations will have a far greater capacity to do harm to other poorly trained people with advanced weapons. And without proper command and control, this sounds like an astounding recipe for an out-of-control Ukraine. Look, I I think that uh, you're right. But one thing that also needs to be fed in here is that, you know, the Americans have uh, started talking about developing these huge stockpiles of weapons in in friendly states like Poland and in the Baltics as a deterrent for, you know, uh, Russian aggression. Uh, the, The thing is that, you know, once you end up doing this kind of thing, surely this is a recipe for escalation of some sorts because the Russians aren't going to just be sitting back thinking, well, we'll let the Americans have the upper hand over here. I don't think that we can do anything about it. Let's let them, you know, run roughshod over over our, our borders that, of course, is something that for centuries the Russians have been concerned with. You know, it's all about expansion and, and consolidation of Russia's borders. And as soon as they feel insecure about that, of course they go on the, on the offensive. Well, we know that the Poles and the French are going to do humid... Blah, sorry, huge armour exercises. Hmm. How are the Russians go- going to perceive huge armour exercises at the same time as all sorts of equipment is being moved through Central Europe to Ukraine? Hmm. So it's not just people training and using training ammo and training equipment, but knowing that those units in training could be you know, rearmed, re-equipped, 
and cross the border into Ukraine very quickly. Mm. So Russia's been sitting on the border ready to go with as much of its repurposed, reconditioned and improved you know, military as possible. Mm. Do we really need to perceive that NATO troops will be sitting in Poland doing the same thing, that they will actually be as ready? You know, Putin's in a precarious enough situation at home already as being credible. You know, things aren't good at home in Russia. An external enemy is necessary. Tension in Ukraine makes his life easier at home. It makes it look like the world's against him. Hmm. If suddenly there's footage of French and Polish armour doing serious exercises and footage of trucks moving huge amounts of equipment towards Poland, at what point does Putin just feel he's got no choice to keep control at home and to keep a sense of, I have power I can use in the world, but to respond? It's interesting. I mean, there there are a lot of things that factor into this whole Ukrainian, American, European issue. Uh, one of which um, is a little known thing called the Budapest Memorandum, which was uh, signed by the Ukrainian authorities in order for them to relinquish their nu- their post Soviet nuclear stockpiles. Um, in essence, the the, um, the the group of countries, which included Russia, France, Germany, the United States that said, okay, Ukraine, if you disarm from the nuclear side of things, we'll guarantee your protection against all comers. And, of course, that really is code for saying Russia. Um, how how would uh, NATO not uh, amping up uh, in, in defense of the authorities in Kiev, how would, how would that actually factor in to this whole Budapest memorandum and, and the defense of Ukraine as an extension of Western power into the East European sphere. I think there's two interesting things there. First of all, the fact that other than really expert opinion, who's talked about the Budapest Memorandum, it's not made it into the mainstream news cycle, Mm. that actually Ukraine shouldn't have to go cap in hand and grovelling for support. Mm. The support should actually be forthcoming because they did the right thing in terms of nuclear weapons. So there's a whole huge issue there. Why aren't the Ukrainians screaming, you owe us, we did the right thing? And why is the media not bringing this forward? So that suggests that there's perhaps other things that are very important on the negotiating table that aren't obviously in the public news cycle yet. The other side of this, and it's very interesting, is you mentioned Budapest. Well, you know, even only two years ago, it would have been assumed that Hungary would have been a player within any NATO action, that it would have conformed to whatever NATO decided to do, every month it gets closer to Russia. It starts becoming less and less recognisable as a central European state with common interests with its neighbours and in desperate need of finance and stability is looking further and further east toward Putin-esque authoritarianism. So if we do get a build-up in Poland of weapons ready to go. This is not something that just potentially affects Russia and what Russia thinks happens next. If Hungary is gradually moving away from Central Europe and Europe as a whole, is starting to see that it has more links with the East, how is it going to perceive massive military exercises and massive weapons build-up so close to home? You know, it's interesting you should say that because, you know, uh, the last couple of podcasts we were actually discussing <clears throat> the role of Greece in, <clears throat> in in the finance of the Eurozone, but also uh, more deeply, well, what, does, what does the idea of Greece peeling off from the Euro centre mean for other European institutions like NATO? And Greece is obviously a key member of NATO. So if you see this kind of situation developing in Hungary, and now we see a bankrupt Greek government potentially reaching out for Russia for financial support, and perhaps even lending the Russians a little bit of a a strategic advantage in the uh, eastern Mediterranean, uh, we're looking at a very interesting situation. And I'm not saying interesting in a good way. I'm saying interesting in a very potentially hot war kind of situation if things spiral out of control. It's conceivable that places like Hungary will come you know, to extreme tension with their neighbours and because they're not a nuclear power, could you know, fire shots in anger at some point in the future. Mm. And we've had the Baltic states worried about their safety. They're likely to cling to the West you know, at any and all cost. Mm. But Hungary's got no benefits from the West. Greece got a lot of money to try and keep things stable and keep it calm. Now the money's run out. They've got political instability to go with their economic instability. 
So if we've got two countries in this state, and at the moment everyone's looking at Greece because it's obvious, mm. but really Hungary is in a more dangerous place. Mm. It's already made the decision to politically head towards authoritarianism to start undoing democratic reforms. And in a sense, its democratic reforms had been stabilised in comparison to Russia. You know, Putin could undo the decentralised democ democratic system that Yeltsin had built because it was so new and it was so fragile. Hungary had a lot more democratic institutions to unravel and unroll, and they've very successfully been unravelled and unrolled. Mm. Does this mean that you know, potentially in other states, you know, for example, Ukraine, if Ukraine continues to be pressured, can democracy stand up in Ukraine, or will the West tolerate any Ukraine possible? Um, well, David, you know, just to just to bring this segment to a close, one one of the things that I would uh, argue very strongly is that this whole situation really comes down to European commitment. What does that mean? Uh, what does it mean for the European Union on the one side, in in support of the authorities in Kiev, and what may it mean for NATO on the other side? But I suppose we'll just have to wait and see how this thing rolls on, and uh, and no doubt we will revisit this topic sometime soon. Today's dis discussion point will be about the Sydney terrorist arrests that have happened this week by the Federal Police and the New South Wales Police. I mean, ever since the uh, Lint Cafe hostage siege last year in December, it's been something that has been worrying people because in Australia we've always thought we were a bit separate from all of this terrorism mm -hmm. happening around the world. But it's happened in Sydney last year and then just um, two months later, people have been arrested for planning possible terrorist attacks. Do we think that this is something that's going to be ongoing throughout the rest of the year and ongoing throughout the future? I think basically it will be ongoing. I mean, there's so many things that we have to discuss on, on, the, on this issue alone. Um, Omar al Kotobi, the 24-year-old student, and Mohammed Kaud, the 25-year-old uh, nurse who, was res who, who had been arrested by um, federal police and uh, New South Wales police, these guys uh, were self-radicalized, and they would fall under the so-called lone wolf category of terrorists. Um, they were only self-radicalized, apparently, over the last six months. One has to wonder, well, how does this kind of thing happen? Well, I, I can tell you a number of things that, that factor in. Firstly, we've got the 24-hour news cycle. Second, we have uh, people from lower socioeconomic areas who are disenfranchised from the community that they grew up in. Say so they grow up in the western suburbs of Sydney, they have no job, they're not likely to have a job, or at least they're underemployed and they feel that they're put out by the rest of the community. Perhaps they have drinking problems, problems of gambling, perhaps they have all kinds of other issues. They, they, they find or they rediscover Islam and they try to then make that connection between their rediscovery of Islam with what's happening in the Middle East. And they see things in a very black and white kind of situation. There's the good guys that are people like al-Nusra or groups like al-Nusra and al-Qaeda and, and uh, ISIL. And then we have you know, the bad guys, namely the West and the United States, the Christian oppressor, uh, oppre oppressors, the, uh, the, the crusaders, if you will. You know, how do you switch the button off people like this? It, in a sense, it's simple, but then it's complicated. If you have a community where, you know, underemployment is rife, if you have people that are in a multicultural setting, but the multicultural components don't come together in a way that makes sense for them, so they feel ostracized and isolated from mainstream community, you're always going to end up having people that feel that they harbor a grudge. And and perhaps, and just perhaps, and I, I actually feel very strongly about this, perhaps there must be a better way of rolling back people like this, the so-called lone wolf. But it's not a policing action so much. It's probably a mental health issue more so. And mental health authorities need to be more closely integrated in the whole counterterrorism domain. Dave? I think it's interesting in this case there have been some media reports that it was community information that led the police to make the arrests, that these two had begun to attract attention within their former community and social groups that, hey, these two guys have changed, they're not doing well anymore, they're not coping. And I think it's really significant that this was a, you know, a preemptive arrest as opposed to after the event. So in December we saw New South Wales police you know, assault teams after a decade of training 
have to do what they've trained for, and it seems like they did an okay job, but there were an awful lot of rounds fired and an awful lot of hours spent with not a lot going on. There are some big questions to be answered. But in time, in terms of investigating potential crimes, for 10 years, New South Wales Police, the Federal Police, all Australian police forces have been working to get better at community policing. So I think in some ways, as much as this might frighten the Australian people, maybe there is actually a good news community policing story here. The communities are realising if we don't take a bit of responsibility for what happens to the young people in our community and we don't perhaps pass some information before they do something terrible, it will be our community as a whole that suffers. At the moment, two guys can be in trouble, but relatively speaking to what could happen to the community as a whole, maybe this is a sign we're actually getting somewhere at dealing. You know, uh, David, I think that from from a short term perspective, I think that that's that's exactly spot on. Uh, one of the other things that uh, came up uh, with the regard to the media um, surrounding the counter terrorist arrests uh, was that the new counter terrorism laws uh, that Senator George Brandis had uh, in- instigated. Um, had also a key role to play in in rolling this up. Now, I think that only um, further investigation into this um, into this particular in- incident will actually unpack that. But do you think that perhaps the tougher stance that the Abbott government has taken in terms of you know counterterrorism here in Australia has had uh, a significant effect on on helping roll back this particular incident at least? I don't know. I'm more inclined to lean towards communities have become more aware, police have become more nuanced, you know, individual organisations are now better at sharing information with each other and working together, and perhaps additional power is useful, but I don't think there's enough data in the public sphere for us to say that you know enhanced laws have made a difference. I think time has made a difference. So whereas the Australian population may be very frightened by what happened this week, oh no, look what nearly happened again. You know, I'll go back to my previous point. Actually, this says that things are working and things are getting better. And whether that is better laws, laws on their own don't work. People have to make use of them effectively, be able to apply them, see the merit in following them. You know, you can't coerce a democratic population. And you can't make police officers do a better job with a new tool unless they understand it and want to liaise and want to work and want to do community policing. So I don't think I would want to reduce it to it just being a change in laws. And any change in laws in relation to security always frightens me if it doesn't have a sunset clause. Well, that's right. I mean, it's it's a dual-edged sword because, you know, you you introduce these laws to essentially look after counter-terrorism, but they're written in a way that you can basically turn the entire instrumentality of state against the the people as a whole uh, Mm -hmm. whenever you feel like it. So it becomes a law by fiat in a sense. Um, One of the things that I I think that we really need to revisit, because you you can take the short-term approach of counter-terrorism, and that's fine, but I think that longer term we still need to revisit things like how effective are policies of multiculturalism or at least political plurality at a cultural level within a Western community where people believe that they have the freedom to express sentiments that are antithetical to you know mainstream life and at least community stability then there's the other aspect and that is that you know if we don't if if governments in the west can't uh, come together and and create better opportunities for their citizens you know there's the old saying you know the uh, idle uh, that idle hands are the devil's plaything you know when people have a lot of time on their hands they feel disenfranchised they've got nothing better to do with themselves you know, they only need a trigger. If they if they watch the 24-hour news bite and they don't really have a, a, a sophisticated understanding of what's going on in the world, it could be that trigger that, that sparks that lone wolf out there that then, you know, hatches the plot and goes out and commits a, another Lint Cafe siege or, or something far worse. Lots of important points in that, but probably the one I want to start with is the fact that we've got to be very careful using the word multiculturalism, that we're talking about it in the context of today. And yet if we look at Australia, since it began to be multicultural, if we look at France, if we look at the UK, if we look at the United States, for many decades in each of these countries, since the beginning of multicultural policies, the outcomes were very, very good. And no one seems to want to have the honest debate that it's not multiculturalism 
per se that has changed. It's the economic opportunities available to new arrivals to become a part of something to succeed and have a new sense of self-worth in their new home. So really when people get upset at multiculturalism, I would really like them to consider, let's look at the different groups that have arrived in Australia right up until the early 1990s when the economy could find a way for them to engage and succeed, multiculturalism worked. Now we've got a situation where youth unemployment is getting higher for all groups, but if you are not proficient in English, if you are not skilled, and if you do not have a social network that can make sure you get a first job, you watch other people succeeding while you don't, and frustrated people, as you said, look for simple answers. Mm. So in a sense, it's frustrated people who first give up on multiculturalism Mm. and then frighten the rest of us into thinking it's multiculturalism that is the problem. But as I said in last week's podcast, economic policy is not about making the economy run right. Economic policy is making an economy serve a society so a society gets the outcomes it wants. And what we haven't seen since '96 is that happen. Mm. Economies be run to serve people. Well... On that note, that's a wrap for this week. We hope that you've enjoyed this episode and we look forward to your company again next week. Our thanks to producer Alicia Moreau, David Olney and the absent Ashley Felderhoff. <laughs> Goodbye for now from the Strategic Con team.